Hi, everyone. It's my pleasure to welcome you to the May Essential Vegan Desserts live event. I'm Fran Costian, the director of Vegan Desserts and Pastry at the Ruby Online Culinary School and the lead instructor for this course. I'm very happy to see so many of you here today. I'm hoping that everyone is well and safe and doing things that they enjoy. I want to welcome our newest students. A new course started today on May 5th. So welcome to anyone who's here who just started. By the way, our courses, because they are self-paced, you're welcome to start. If you're thinking about the course, you can still sign up for another week or so. Extensions are possible and so on, but I'm not going to get into the details now. I want to be able to talk about our interesting, I think it's an interesting topic, and answer as many questions as I can for you all today. Just a little bit of housekeeping first. Any guests, welcome. Continuing students and graduates, welcome. I'm always so excited to do these events and get a chance to see some of the faces that I like to see and so on. I wanna thank Patrick, our engineer producer at Ruby. He's always really patient with me helping to set up. So I want to remind any of our students that if you haven't joined, become a member yet of our private Facebook group for essential vegan desserts, please do that. We're gonna put the link up there. It's a great place to interact with other students. We have new people, we have graduates. I ask you to stay in the group and so we can keep interacting with one another. And it's a terrific place to ask questions about equipment, for example, or kinds of ingredients and so on. Any questions that are particular to an assignment or anything in the syllabus are best asked in the Q&A section within the course. I answer those questions. Anything I can't answer, which is very rare, but we have some real culinary encyclopedias at Ruby and I take them over there. If you have a problem of a technical sort, then you write to support at ruby.com and someone from the team will get back to you very shortly. And you can always write to me at fran at ruby.com. So those are things I want to remind you about. And one other thing for any of our current students, within the course, when you get to a particular assignment, there is a way for you to look and see the work that other students have done at that particular assignment and some comments. Sometimes, not very often, but occasionally someone will send something to me that is, well, I don't want to say wrong, but okay, it was didn't meet the learning that we wanted for that particular assignment. Let's talk about the trifle, for instance. For example, the trifle is a large format dessert. You don't have to have a trifle bowl, but we expect to see a large format dessert. Sometimes I get a parfait instead. That's not what we're looking for. And then the student will, I like to interact with my students and say, well, I saw that in, the, in a photo. So just because somebody put their photo up doesn't mean it's correct. So read the criteria for every single assignment. There's no one size fits all. And then do the best that you can, particularly today with ingredients being a little bit difficult to find. The final dessert parties that are coming in are magnificent and really clever in the way that people are doing them. So I wanna thank you all for that. And I wanna thank you for inspiring me with your work. Now let's get right into, uh, I see Patrick put up the link to the Facebook group. So this is for people who are enrolled in the course or have been in the course only. Now I have a bunch of questions. I'm going to start answering them and I have props as well. 
So I want to show those to you. Carol wants to know, what do you consider to be the healthiest liquid sweetener, agave, brown rice syrup, maple syrup, or honey? How do you decide which to use in a recipe when texture may be affected? That's a really good question, Carol. We go, we have a whole chapter. No, it's not a chapter. This isn't a book, but we have a whole unit on granulated sweeteners and liquid sweeteners in the course and describe each one very carefully and suggest where they work and where they don't work. And they don't, they're not necessarily interchangeable at all, actually. Rice syrup, for example, which I know was this was my liquid sweetener of choice over 25 years ago when I first changed my diet and was really following macrobiotic lifestyle, pretty much I would say. It's thick, that's fine. It's sticky, it's not very sweet. I happen to really like the taste. It reminds me of a caramel in a way. And I like it. There are particular ways to work with it. You want to get it warm so that you can measure it and so on. But what happens when you use rice syrup in a batter-based dessert? It bakes gummy cakes and it makes really hard cookies. So this is one of the attributes that you need to learn about when you're baking. Agave is very difficult to bake with, the temperature has to be lowered, the liquids have to be figured out and so on. So I don't use that. My favorite of the liquid sweeteners is maple syrup. I use grade A dark. Grade A dark used to be grade B, but it seems that B was signifying to people an inferior product. So the marketing, Folks in the maple world changed it to grade A dark. And that is a very versatile sweetener. In a cake like a chocolate cake or a spice cake, you really don't necessarily taste the maple, and that's a good thing. But by using this robust dark maple, you get a lot of sweet for your buck, so to speak. Um, for less sweet desserts, I've been more and more using date syrup, which is also known as Salon. That's S-L-I-A-N. I use a brand from a company called Soam, S-O-O-M. I use their tahini as well. I'm not an affiliate. I just find it a very nice product. So I have a recipe to show you, for example, that I made up because I'm doing quarantine pantry as well. I will say that my pantry, my pantry is very well stocked. It just always is, and it's come in very handy during this time. But I wanted to make something where you could easily swap with what you have more of, what you have nothing of, and so on, and would be quite relatively healthy. So I made oat bars. This is just a little square that I cut of the bars. And I, what I did was, here was a place where I could use date syrup, which I think is a very nice syrup to use. You know, all sweeteners are sweeteners. This is not where I get my healthy. I'm not going to drink a jug of maple syrup or a cup of date syrup or anything like that but they are more healthful, they are less refined. You always want to use a brand that is transparent so you can see what's in there. You always want to read the label. There was when Agave first launched to great fanfare a number of years ago, it was hailed as the holy grail of sweeteners. I didn't believe it because I had heard that before about rice syrup. So some agave was put out on the market that was cut with corn syrup. There are things that happen, so you want to be really careful about that and read labels. I don't personally use honey as a vegan. I find it congesting for me. I am not 100% against honey, as many vegans are, because I saw a film called Queen of the Sun, 
and talked about the beekeepers who are really taking care of the bees, not taking all of their honey. And you know, if you have read about the food system, you know that with we need bees, they're pollinators. Without bees, we have no food. But I don't use honey. And again, these sweeteners are not interchangeable. So if you can see, these are the bars. I think we have a photo of them as well. And back here is some banana bread because who isn't making banana bread today? I don't know. It seems like it's a real thing, but I happen to like banana bread. What I did with those to make those bars. Oh, before I tell you, I want to show you this. This is the same mixture as the bar. What I did was when I had the mixture tasted good, looked good to me. I thought, what else can I do with this? You know, I patted it out. I left out a cup because I, I want to see what I can do to make one recipe work more than one way. So to about one cup of the mixture, the other was patted into a square and I put it away to get firm enough and to cut it. I added a tablespoon of hot water to one cup of the same mixture, and I got this lovely, lovely crumble. In our course, we teach how to roast fruit. I had one pear in the house, just one pear, and it was getting to the point where it would go overripe pretty soon. So I roasted it, and I sprinkled some of this on and then heated it up and it was absolutely delicious. What I did to make those oat squares was I used oats. I used, I'm looking at them so I know, sunflower seeds, pumpkin seeds. I used, I diced up some, I cut actually, it's easier to cut dried fruit for me anyway with a scissors dried apricots. Why apricots? Because I happen to have more apricots in the house right now than anything else. And they make things taste good and chewy and they're healthy. I like dried apricots. And I decided for my sweetener, I would use the date syrup. It tastes, if you haven't tasted date syrup, and this is different from date paste, we teach fruit paste, in the course, if you haven't tasted it, tastes like a very mild molasses or sorghum syrup. So those are syrups that you could interchange. You could also use some maple syrup and rice syrup as a combination. And I used tahini, which is a high protein sesame paste. I'm sorry, I banged my computer there. You can use peanut butter, almond butter, cashew butter, anything like that. But I was looking for something that would be, wasn't going to shout peanut butter at me, a little bit more neutral. And there you have something that's really healthy. If I didn't have rolled oats, which I happen to have plenty of, I always have a lot of oats in the house, I would have used maybe some quinoa flakes. And that may likely, I would say for sure, the liquid proportion would have been different. But what you're going to do is just make it work with something like this. It's not a cake, it's a snack. I could have made balls. I believe we can show you something else to do with rolled oats. It's an overnight oat pudding with, I call it a nibby chocolate pudding. It was done for the Theo chocolate cookbook. So it's overnight oats made the way you make overnight oats, you take rolled oats, pour your plant milk of choice over, put this in the refrigerator, the oats get really creamy, and then you can add some chia, some flax, cinnamon is always a good healthy spice. Don't forget, you get some real benefit to these spices. I like ginger, I like turmeric, I like cinnamon, and then just for fun, I grated a little bit of dark high percentage chocolate and some cacao nibs, which are really quite healthy on top and loaded up with blueberries. I haven't seen any blueberries in my house in a while, but that's something else you can do. So I hope that answers your question, Carol. 
The bottom line is they are not interchangeable and they will affect texture. My favorite gluten-free flour blend, not store-bought. Well, I will tell you that the store-bought favorite blend is Bob's Red Mill, one-to-one, -one, all-purpose gluten-free flour. It's got the blue label. We have a gluten-free flour mix in the course. That's very nice. And many of the students are making their own. Bob's is complete. If you're making a gluten-free flour mix up of your own, you're going to need to add some xanthan gum or guar gum for sure. Uh, Carol wants to know for an online source for purchasing non-dairy chocolate, 12 ounce packages, well, yeah, they're expensive. I tend to buy bulk. You can go to um, Chaka Spear or let's see, I think I wrote down the name of some chocolates. Carol, why don't you send an email to me, friend at ruby.com, and I'll get back to you. But there are a lot of sources for bulk chocolates. Right now, shipping is definitely taking longer. If you can afford to buy a quantity, chocolate, as long as it is kept cool in a cool and dark place, will last for quite a long period of time. So there you go. I see Angela says she's become sugar sensitive since she started cooking macrobiotic and whole food plant-based. If there's anyone here who doesn't know what whole food plant-based means, essentially what it means is you're eating foods in their natural states, well, edible, as whole as possible. And whole food plant-based people tend not to use added oils as well. Um, you can't, no, rice syrup actually is not, it's still a sweetener. It can raise your glycemic index and so on. So you can't swap it out. For people who are very sugar sensitive, the thing to do is to make a recipe that doesn't need added sweetener. Make a Canton. I think we have a photo that Patrick might be able to put up of a fruit gel. So when I say a canton, if you're following a macrobiotic diet, you probably know that that is an agar gel. There are lots of ways to make that absolutely delicious. In the course, we talk about using agar, which is, it works in place of bovine gelatin. It's actually easier to work with once you understand how to work with it. We use both flakes and powder. They are not interchangeable. The powder is four to five times as strong as the flakes. So if you think you can take flakes and just grind them up in your coffee grinder, that's not going to work. But make yourself a nice fruit gel. Um, now, can I prepare many of these snacks for the week? Absolutely. I mean. The bars that I showed you came out of my freezer. I tend to keep them in the freezer. They can stay at room temperature. Little truffles, you can make date, make uh, truffles out of dried fruit and so on. Granola, this should work for a long time. Now here's an interesting second question. And that is you wanna learn how to use carob in place of chocolate and biscotti and snacks. I'm glad that you brought that up. Um, you know, how I got here really was, I was trained as a traditional pastry chef and then I decided to change my diet for health reasons. And when I was exploring the desserts that were available, of course, we're talking about a very, very long time ago, we didn't have the variety of yummy plant milks and so on that we have today. And it just was a different time. But somebody, gave me a brown cake and said, here's a chocolate cake. And it was awful. It was brown, but it was carob. Carob is not chocolate. You know, carob is just definitely not chocolate. In fact, my kids in LA have a carob tree that grows and the deer is just like it. So I've seen the pods. When you're using powdered carob, carob is sweeter. Carob powder is sweeter naturally from nature than unsweetened cocoa powder, for example. But it doesn't taste great. 
I find that roasting the carrot powder first really helps enhance the flavor and then sift it because it will get hard around the edges. Carob confections, if what you're talking about is using carob chips, for example, instead of chocolate chips, read the labels because carob confections notoriously have some really some ingredients in there that we don't consider to be healthful. So that's something that you want to consider. Um, alternative flowers like chickpea flour, spelt, millet, etc. That's a very complicated question. Of your list for swapping for AP flour, spelt flour, which is wheat, is able to be swapped out. Spelt is wheat. So sometimes people will say to me, oh, you know, I made a gluten-free cake and I say, oh, well, what was the flour mix? Well, I use spelt and that makes me crazy because I'm not gluten sensitive, I'm not gluten free. It doesn't really matter to me, but for somebody who is, that's a real problem. Spelt is considered to be unhybridized ancient wheat. Spelt comes in two forms, whole spelt, which is more like whole wheat flour, and white spelt, which isn't completely white, but it is lighter, and I use a combination in place of the AP flour or the whole wheat pastry flour in the recipe. Spelt tends to be a little bit thirstier than wheat, than the standard wheat flour, so you might have to watch it. Also your cupcakes, it's delicious. It bakes items that are absolutely delicious, but your cupcakes aren't going to necessarily dome. It's a, it's a kind of an interesting thing. Um, Kevin wants to know about magical tips for high altitude baking. Well, there's nothing magical. Uh, it's a very complicated question. And I suggest you go to some of the sites, the university sites in Colorado and New Mexico have tons of really good information. I know that Generally speaking, you raise the temperature of what you're baking 15 to 25 degrees. That's a spread for sure. And it depends on what kind of cake you're baking. Baking powder, baking soda, the leaveners tend to be cut a little bit and the sugar tends to be cut a little bit. So with all that said, one of my former students who really liked our signature cake, the chocolate cake to live for, lived over 3,000 feet. I forgot which state she was in, but it was really high. And the first time she made that cake, she said exploded all over her oven. And she told me, actually just yesterday, we were in touch again. I love to stay in touch with people. She said that she finds that by adding about two tablespoons of flour to most recipes does the trick to her. So you're gonna have to do some experimenting and researching about that. In terms of the question, I'm getting a lot of questions here about whole food plant-based desserts. And I know that I said, well, you know, you can do a baked apple, You can, or I didn't say that, baked apple, poached fruit, fruit gels, and so on. I suspect that many of you may know Rip Esselstyn of the Engine 2 diet and his father Caldwell Esselstyn and they promote a whole food plant-based no all diet. I made Rip's wedding cakes and it was a thrill and every table had a cake and then Rip and his wife Jill cut one cake. The reason that I'm telling you this is that sometimes even someone like Rip and Dr. Esselstyn want a cake. We have birthdays, we have celebrations, so you can decide what to do. That's what that's I think that's a really interesting thing about that. Now let's see. Um, tips for nut seed and oil-free vegan baking. Well, you can bake a cake without nuts and seeds, that's for sure, and use a milk that isn't, don't use almond milk, for example, you know, use coconut milk beverage or oat milk. And 
I personally don't do this, but I have had many students in essential vegan desserts who tell me that using applesauce as a swap for oil in the recipe works really well. We have a section in the syllabus on swapping fat with how to swap out the fat. And so you can try that. You can use your applesauce. I happen to love prune puree. That's in my gluten-free brownie bites. I think it really enhances the taste of chocolate. So you can, and, and some people, and more and more, I tend to be combining some banana. So I think I'm probably the only pastry chef I've ever met who doesn't really like the taste of banana desserts too much as banana desserts, but banana, date paste, applesauce, put that all together and give it a try and see what you think. We have a photo of, we make a fruit slump, which is cooked fruit with a soft biscuit batter dolloped over the top. And then the pot is covered very tightly because the biscuits actually steam on top of the stove. And it's called a slump because it's an old American dessert from the colonial days. And the question was, are the biscuits grunting as they steam or are they slumping into the batter? I don't know, it's delicious. That whole recipe that is enough to serve eight people has one and a half tablespoons of oil. So I'm not swapping out that oil. I like it the way it is. But I had a student recently tell me that they took the oil out and they used applesauce. So there you go. Um, whole food plant-based desserts seem to be mostly dates, nut, coconut, and fruit. I don't think so. I, I find that those tend to be really heavy desserts. So you can, I mean, this bar again, I'm picking it up because I'm gonna eat it when we're finished. There is no oil in here. There is no dates, there's no coconut. So there's lots that you can do. We have a lovely light fruit, we call it fruit soup and salad in the course as a way to learn about agar. You use very little agar, just enough to give the fruit some body and then fill it, fill the plate out with lots of fresh fruit and pretty garnishes and things. And that's something that you can do. Um, online source for bulk duck chocolate. You can go to any of the companies, call them up or send an inquiry and ask them. I've been getting bulk chocolate from Taza, T-A-Z-A -A, chocolate, which is a whole food plant. <laughs> Listen to me with the whole foods. It's a fair trade chocolate with great ethics and good taste. And I ordered uh, their 70% couverture, 3.3, no, it's six pounds. It's 3.3 kilograms and they shipped it and it's delicious. Republica de Cacao send, sells larger quantities and so does Valrona. So you should be able to get that from Cho as well. This is an interesting question. We have somebody here who is has a, a doesn't get along with baking soda. Baking soda is necessary in desserts, in batter-based desserts where it is listed. Often baking soda and baking powder are used in combination. Baking powder has some baking soda in it. Um, you use so little, it really shouldn't matter. So I wonder if you're just using too much. Baking soda is a leavening agent. Now on my blog today, if you're interested in reading and getting a recipe for the original chocolate depression cake, this cake came out of wartime. It's called the depression cake, the wacky cake, the craters of the moon cake, bake, mix in the pancake, World War II cake, because people didn't have eggs and milk at the time, kind of like today in a way. And that cake was leavened. So I call it the accidentally vegan chocolate cake. That cake was leavened with baking soda and vinegar. 
So baking powder, baking soda, and vinegar are the ways we get our cakes leavened. Again, because I started doing this before, way before there were any commercial egg replacers on the market, I don't really use egg replacers. I use baking powder, baking soda, and vinegar. When you're using a non-alkalized cocoa powder, you use baking soda. When you're using an alkalized or Dutch processed cocoa powder, you use baking soda and baking powder. If you're interested in the whys about it, you're gonna find that information in this course. And also on my blog, just go to francostigan.com and look for it. I know that it came out today. Mary wants to know, what does clabber mean? That's a great question. Thank you, Mary. All the questions have been good. When you put an acid like vinegar or lemon juice into some milk, and here we're talking about plant milk, it sours the milk or clabbers it. So we're making really a buttermilk substitute. It's not going to taste like buttermilk, if anybody remembers the taste of buttermilk, but it will work like buttermilk. You want to use a higher protein milk for the best results. Soy milk clabbers the best for people who are avoiding soy. Oat milk clabbers, almond milk clabbers, rice milk does not clabber at all. So good grab and go snacks. Well, again, something like a bar like this. I have, um, I think muffins are great grab and go. In my first book, More Great Good Dairy-Free Desserts, I have an, I think I call it a power muffin, but it's a little, it's a muffin that can be baked as a muffin size. My muffins tend to be a little bit smaller than other people's, the ones you get in the store that could feed four people. Also minis, and it's made with oat flour and all kinds of healthy things with some jam in the center or nut butter in the center, put them in the freezer and take them out and go. Little, um, I want to, I've got some truffles here that are really pretty chocolate truffles. So I actually consider a high percentage chocolate to be a good snack, but you can make truffles energy balls. I have did something for Dr. Greger uh, for his book launch for How Not to Die. I made How Not to Die Bites, and they were all kinds of um, dried fruits and chia seeds and flax seeds and pumpkin seeds probably and whatever. All those things are really handy. I would suggest you can make some granola and keep it packaged and take that and go with you. All of these things need minimal care. You keep them in your fridge or freezer. My, you know, granola can stay at room temperature, but for longer storage, I like to keep things in the refrigerator or freezer. Any breads like banana bread, you know, the muffins and the quick breads, one and the same. So that really works. Um, Vicki wants to know, aside from brownies, are there any desserts that would work for black beans? I'm, I don't especially use black green beans in my dessert. So I have nothing for you exactly. When I do a bean-based dessert, I prefer a dookie beans, the little red Japanese beans, that's just personal. Uh, there are a lot of people who puree white beans and put them into desserts. So you could add them very easily into puddings. So I can't really talk about that more because I don't have an answer. I do have a beet here that hasn't been roasted. I have a bunch of beets that are gonna get roasted tonight. And this is something you can do to up the protein, the vegetableness of a dessert. When I make chocolate pudding, I like chocolate pudding. It's fast, it satisfies me. Almost everybody likes pudding. I've been talking about, you know, what is it that satisfies us right now? Is it, for a lot of people, it's crunchy food. Maybe they're getting rid of stress. And for a lot of people, it's creamy food. So you may fit somewhere in the middle. I like my creamy foods with something crunchy on the top. But I, you know, you can puree some cooked beet and put it into chocolate pudding. You can take leftover or fresh 
sweet potato, for example, and put that in your oatmeal. It's absolutely delicious. So try that sometime. Um, you have powdered soy milk is the way to rehydrate it so it doesn't take chalky or gritty. I haven't used powdered soy milk in a really long time. I use powdered coconut milk powder and I don't find that gritty and I use powdered cashew milk and that's not gritty. That doesn't help answer your question though. I would try blending it maybe with warm water and blending it in a do it in a blender and see if that helps add a <laughs> add a date that might help. Grace wants to know what's a good replacement for lard. Oh my goodness. Well, you can try coconut oil. That ought to do the trick. Mary wants to know, can you make soy milk in a Vitamix? I have not, but Vitamix says that you can. For questions like this, or, you know, where can I find this? Or can I make this in this kind of equipment? Those websites have a lot of information. In that case, I would go to Vita Vitamix. I know there are plant milk makers and that people swear by. I use my, I happen to have a Vitamix. It's a very old one. It's a 5200. I've had it for years and it works great. And I make plant milks in my Vitamix. I have a friend who makes homemade soy milk, the best I've ever had. Her name is Alice Long. She's the chef at Soy Cafe in Philadelphia. Her soy milk, her homemade soy milk is almost like heavy cream. She uses a soy milk maker. So you might want to do that. Getting back to making plant milks though, if you're in a hurry, I want to tell you that you can take ground like almond meal or a hazelnut meal and blend that up with water. If you haven't soaked nuts or you're out of nuts or something, it works a charm. I've started doing that. And with oat milk, I just updated this on my blog, but I discovered quite by accident really, because <laughs> I reached for some ice water, that soaking rolled oats for 30 minutes, not longer, draining them, pouring the water off, rinsing them and then using ice water and blending just until they're blended no longer and straining it makes a really nice, nice oat milk. Favorite resource for ordering spices online. Well, my favorite company was is Penzies. Uh, I believe that they are not doing orders right now. I think that's going to change soon. Nuts.com has some spices. They also have nuts. They probably have chocolate as well. So that's something that you can look into. With spices, you want to buy the amount that you think you're going to use in a reasonable time. I go through a lot of cinnamon. Oh, this is actually pensies. So this size is fine. Something that I don't use so much of, I buy something smaller. You want to Sniff your spices if you don't smell anything. Get rid of them. Don't buy the big giant size. Okay, we have someone here who eats 30 grams of walnuts with your oat roots every morning as well as 20 grams of flax. Um, well, the question is about fat. I eat walnuts. I eat almonds. I eat pecans. And I eat flax not all at once. I tend not to put them on my oatmeal. I My oatmeal has fruit on it and it has some flaxseed in it and cinnamon, sometimes ginger, sometimes turmeric, change up the spices. But I save the nuts and seeds for snacking during the day. I am not worried about the fat in nuts and seeds and flax. That's good fat. So that is not a problem for me. Oh, I think I'm going to be very jealous of Kate. Kate's garden is blessing her with tons of blueberries. Oh, what I would give for a blueberry. Uh, snack ideas besides fresh out of the hand and on yogurt. The blueberry slump recipe would be really great. Blueberry muffins are always good. You can put them in cookies and freeze them. Flash, freeze them, wash them, dry them, lay them out in a single layer, 
and then put them in packages. If you don't have a whole lot of room in your freezer, make flat packages and see if you can do that. I think you're very lucky. Uh, Lizabetha says she lives abroad and some ingredients are hard to find. Um, talk to me about something that you can't get for the course and I will help you do swaps. We have had students from absolutely every, I can't think of any country in the world that has not been in a Ruby course and certainly not in essential vegan desserts. We have people everywhere now and they have been able to find ingredients, but we'll be able to help you out. You just don't want to swap something where it matters. Don't go, well, I didn't have flour, so I used some almond and I used some flax. You have to know the basics. And that's the real beauty of this course is that you learn foundational techniques. I would like everybody ideally to make the recipe the way it's written in this course the first time. So you have a baseline. You're welcome to make a half recipe. Then you can go off and do testing. But again, when you're testing, do a half recipe to see how it works for you. Deborah wants to know how I feel about yacon syrup. Well, I love the taste of it. I know it is considered to be a superfood. It's very expensive. I don't use it very much. I use more date syrup, salon, and sorghum when I want that kind of taste. But yacon is really good. Ah, the sourdough question. Okay. Um, can you use homemade sourdough starter in place of yeast in cakes? I have sourdough in my fridge. Now, I haven't baked bread before this particular period of time, probably in 20 years. But like many people, I started baking bread and I started baking with um, the no need bread that was very popular, Jim Leahy. I mean, I'm originally from New York, so I went to that bakery, the New York Times no need bread. One of my former students and friends and Ruby Plant Pro grad, Dory Passan, lives right up the street. Dory is a certified sourdough bread expert. And she ordered tons of flowers and shared them around. Now, I had plenty of yeast, but Dory gave me a piece of her starter. I named the starter Dory 19, and I was feeding the starter and then had all this discard. And discard is when you're, if you're not familiar, when you're making sourdough and feeding the starter, the sourdough, you take some off and you discard it, except you don't discard it if you don't like waste, like most of us don't, and put it in a separate jar and then just keep it in the fridge. So I have made scones, I have made kind of an English muffin. My favorite is to make a pancake. I, in one version, I saute up a lot of vegetables and then thin the discard and make a pancake. And in another one, I did it that was savory. I took it to the sweet side uh, by adding some toppings and it was really delicious. I have not used my sourdough in place of yeast in cakes yet, but I may probably in a quick bread or in a brownie more than a cake. Let me know if you do, Erin. Um, tips for baking at sea level. Well, this is sea level. <laughs> I bake at sea level. My tips are as follows. Use, the in use quality ingredients. Measure carefully. Get your mise en place set. That means simply get everything that you need for the recipe out and available to you so that it's there. If the nuts have to be roasted and cooled, do that ahead. You don't want to have any surprises. Preheat your oven. Get the oven rack in the right place before you get started. Set yourself up for success. That's for sure. Jill wants to know which course am I speaking of? This is the Essential Vegan Desserts course at Ruby. It's a 90-day all-desserts course. We take a deep dive into everything about desserts. Um, 
Yes, there is information about the equipment that's needed. You can write to support at ruby.com if you want to see the equipment beforehand. Anybody, as soon as people sign up, they get an equipment list and an ingredients list. So we do that, but if you need to see that ahead or you'd like to see that ahead, just write to support at ruby.com. Carol's registered in the Forks Over Knife Essentials and you're not sure, I'm glad you enjoyed it. All of our Ruby live events are open to everyone at Ruby and to guests. What's different between enrolled students in any of the courses as well as guests is that for our enrolled students or former students, these live events live in the archive so you can go back and look. And that's really a terrific thing. So for example, I had a guest last year who wrote the book on aquafaba. I am guessing that most of you have heard of aquafaba, which is essentially chickpea liquid, the brine after cooked chickpeas. You used to throw it down the drain. Now it's like this magical thing that can replace eggs and make cookies and baked Alaska I made. Are these cute or what? I folded some dried, I ground up some freeze dried strawberries into the meringue. This is eggless meringue. It's made with aquafaba. And the other day I made, this is going to be a pavlova. And um, to keep my meringues from getting humid, the same thing as an egg meringue, I use food grade desiccant packets. So that's a really terrific thing to have on hand. And if yours don't come out quite the way you want them, or you have too many, or they get a little soft, I break them up into shards, put them in the freezer and make what's called an eaten mess that comes from the UK. And it was a famous dessert that was served at Eaton, which I think was a very shishi boarding school for boys and just use creams and lots of fruit and so on. So it's really, it's really fun. Um, sweetener, ste oh, stevia and monk fruit. I personally use granulated sweeteners and liquid sweeteners that I feel are more natural. Now this is a choice. So I use organic cane sugar, which has had most of the molasses taken out, but not all of it. I use coconut sugar, which is considered a sustainable and lower glycemic sugar. I, I really, I, that word, you know, lower glycemic is a little tricky because it's a giant topic and how the sweeteners react to you. Remember, we're all individuals. We're all individuals. We digest things differently for me, it depends on where I am, what I've eaten before and so on. Um, but coconut sugar is something that I really like to use in place of brown sugar, for example. I use whole cane sugar, which is the sugar cane with all of the molasses intact. And that I use that where that molasses -y taste is going to work. So those are the things I don't use monk fruit and stevia i use the leaf i don't use the drops and I, although you know if it works for you do it i don't like the taste of it i don't like the way it behaves but when i was at there's a spa in tecate mexico called rancho la preta and everything comes from the ground you eat right out of the garden and for the first time I got to see stevia leaves that were dried and they are so sweet and delicious that it's really wonderful. Monk fruit is lohan and in my opinion, it has been so highly processed to get the natural bad taste out of it. You know, nature is really interesting, right? If you've ever had quinoa that doesn't taste good, it hasn't been rinsed, might taste soapy, that's because there is a substance on the quinoa when it's growing in nature 
called Sa it's saponins and it is soapy and in the andes people would rinse that off and wash their hair with it actually so you want to rinse your quinoa very well. well it's the same thing with the lohan which is the real name for monk fruit and it's it's very bitter it's very bitter so i actually worked on a project to bring this into <laughs> the public and the original that's how i learned how highly processed it was i am finally <laughs> i am testing some recipes with what i call these are not artificial sweeteners but to me they're more highly processed sweeteners so it's a choice they don't always work in something like aquafaba they can work in a cookie so you you want to decide about that for yourself. Michelle says you'd like to take this course after Forks Over Knives. Well, I'd love to have you. I'd love to have you. Does anybody have any final questions for me? I think not. Um, I want to just see if I showed you. Oh, here's an interesting little snack. So this is actually dried corn. I, I mean, I went through my pantry. We do a pantry reset in all of the courses, and I go through mine quite a lot. Actually, I enjoy doing it and like what's seen there. And something that I didn't talk about, but I see it right here that I want to talk about is tofu. Now, I know <laughs> that there are people who are soy avoiders. I have been eating soy for over 25 years not the processed soy. I don't eat TVP and I eat whole soy. So I eat tempeh, I eat edamame and I eat tofu and probably a few times a week. I use soy milk. I don't drink it. I, I mean, I just don't drink a glass of soy milk, but I use it. This kind of tofu that's packaged in the aseptic container is a good pantry item to have. And this one says extra firm, but this is silken tofu. So even as it's extra firm, it's going to be soft and it makes great sauces. It makes a good tofu scramble too, but you know, a, a way to give yourself a nice healthy dessert. Let's say you made one of those fruit soups or agar gels or puddings and you want to give it a little je ne sais quoi, just some boost, make a sauce with tofu. We have several in the course and it's really good. And I know that there are people, it's Cinco de Mayo now, so there are people who make mousses and things with avocado. I just got 12 organic avocados from a company in California called Ace Ranch. And I would say that this doesn't necessarily fall into the healthy, healthy, but it is Cinco de Mayo, and that is the chocolate margarita ice cream in my cookbook, because every once in a while you might want that. Don't forget that beverages, thick, thick, delicious beverages can be healthy snacks. They are for me as well. So you can make yourself a smoothie. I don't happen to take like the taste of hemp. I find it grassy as a milk, but I use that as a base for smoothies because there's so much protein in hemp and then add maybe some raw cacao powder, kale, spinach, all kinds of things. And it's just really delicious and satisfying. A date here and there is a really great thing. Take a nice plump majole date. We talked about this last month. Either eat it out of hand, put it in your freezer, and you'll think you're eating caramel. Stuff it with a nut or some chocolate. And what could be, you know, what could be better? Dried fruit makes a nice snack. I like to mix things up. Don't forget what we used to call it: gorp, good old raisins and peanuts. Um, put some chocolate chips in if you want, and make it a treat. Popcorn makes a really nice, healthy treat. Last week, last month, I talked about wanting, having wanted to make polenta, and I make that with a coarser grind cornmeal, and all I had in my freezer was a fine cornmeal. So I thought, what the heck? I got this idea from a Ruby grad, 
And I, in my Vitamix, I ground up some popping corn and made corn flour and made corn pancakes with practically no ingredients. They were absolutely delicious. I took them to the sweet side. I took them to the savory side. So it was fine. One Again, once you have the foundations of how to do things correctly, you can go off and make them your own. Um, Linda wants to know, she bought a cans of chickpea but didn't pay attention, they're salted. You can probably use it. As you reduce the aquafaba, this is one of the things where I differ from a lot of the rest, a lot of the recipe writers out there is, I always reduce the liquid by about a third and then chill it before I make meringue. So the salt may come through a little bit more, but I don't think it will be a problem. You know, we have one of the most popular recipes in this course is baked Alaska. So baked Alaska, typically, if you don't know, is a piece of cake, some ice cream, and meringue that gets torched. Well, I mean, it's just so much fun. It's like miraculous to watch the meringue happen from the aquafaba from the chickpea liquid. But let's say you want to take it to the healthier side. Make nice cream, which is banana ice cream. I've put aquafaba meringue just a little bit on a fruit salad and it's delicious. So you can do things like that. You don't have to have all the components. Um, well, Maria, I would love to work with you if you come. This is Maury New. The brand is Maury New. Frankly, it is the only brand I've ever seen of this aseptic pack. When you're using silk and tofu, if you buy the kind in the refrigerator case, that has to be drained. This doesn't. Now, the question is, do you use whole wheat for baking or only white flour? I don't use white flour. I use, well, I use all-purpose flour. My basic mix, and again, this course is not one size fits all. We really teach you how to think and what to do. But almost all of my batter-based recipes are 50% all-purpose flour, 50% whole wheat pastry flour, which is different from whole wheat flour. It's lower protein. And, you know, you could use all whole wheat pastry flour, you can use all AP, you can use 30, 40, whatever. So have a blast. I hope you're all staying safe and comfortable and observing social distancing. I wear my mask whenever I go out. I hope your pantries are full. I hope you're eating healthy. I mean, I like a dessert a little bit every day, but I eat grains and greens and beans and salads like crazy. Thank you all for being here with me. I really appreciate your taking the time out of your busy day, and I'll see you in June. Take care.